Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito What's up, Knight fans? Welcome to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. My name is Jeff Sharon, and I'm joined... As usual, by my good friend and partner in crime, Eric Lopez. Jeffrey, it's an exciting week. Night's home game, and I think a week that, uh, to be honest, I've been looking forward to for a while. Yeah, I think that we've been looking forward to this game for quite some time because I think we're finally going to have a gauge. UCF Maryland uh, at Bright House Networks this uh, Saturday. UCF taking on a Big Ten opponent. Should be a very good crowd uh, and should be a very interesting Gauge for UCF to see really where they are uh, against a tough non-conference opponent. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at UCF underscore Banneret. Uh, you can follow Eric at Eric Lopez Elo. You can follow me at Jeff underscore Sharon. And don't forget to follow the Black and Gold Banneret on Facebook as well. As on well, we mentioned on Twitter, UCF underscore Banneret. And uh, subscribe to our uh, email newsletter uh, to get all the latest from uh, the site as we head into another weekend of uh, UCF sports, another busy weekend of UCF sports, especially on campus. We're going to talk about football, Eric, and obviously the Knights uh, getting uh, crushed up in the big house, 51 to 14. But um, the spin coming off of this game from UCF and particularly Coach Frost, I thought was uh, – Really interesting, and there are some th- good things that happened in that game. Obviously, you know you fall down thirty-one nothing, um, especially in a place like that against. And let's face it, Michigan's a good team. Remember how last week I talked about how skeptical I was about Michigan? Yes, uh, my skepticism has been alleviated for the moment. <laughs> and, that didn't take long. No, I didn't. A credit to Michigan; they they looked really good, uh, especially in the passing game, which uh, I guess we shouldn't be surprised at, but. Um, the key takeaway for UCF from that game as we put a bow on it, getting ready for the next game, was the run offense and the run defense. The Knights uh, ha- ran as a team for six yards a carry in that game and gave up only 2.9. So uh, now are we making too much of a good uh, are we making too much of a good thing here or is that significant to you, Eric? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. It's That's hard because to the game was kind of went the, the direction it did. I mean, UCF was playing from behind early, dug themselves a hole. They kept running the football. I thought they did some good job run blocking, but it's hard to, to gauge, you know, as far as, you know, what was Michigan playing pass when you have a big lead, you know, things like that. I was more, I think to me, the, you know, everybody's focused on the rushing yards offensively. Uh, the run defense to me. I thought was the story from UCF. That was the big positive. I, I thought they held their own against 41, Michigan's yeah, offensive line. Yeah, 41 carries for Michigan, only 119 yards net rushing. That's 2.9 a carry. This is a team that we went back and uh, – um, well, I'll go ahead and pull up the numbers from last year. But this is a very good rushing team. And you talked about last week how um, how – one good thing that Brady Hoke did was he recruited the heck out of uh, the front uh, out of the out of the front lines. Yeah, and uh, that was a pretty impressive performance by UCF against that uh, offensive line. It really was. They were not pushed around. I thought the the players were flying around. Now, obviously, they you know give Michigan credit. They got they they gave up some passing plays, and, and Michigan you know was tremendous passing the football. Will Spate. Looks like a legit quarterback. I mean, Jim Harbaugh knows how what he's doing with that. But, you know, Michigan can run the football, too. And I, I was impressed. I mean, we, we saw this last season, Jeff, where UCF, I mean, among many things, got pushed around. and gave up a lot of yards rushing. So, to me, that was the more interesting thing to me. 
that jumped out because, you know, Michigan couldn't really just establish the run and dominate the line of scrimmage, I think. And they threw the ball more. And that's why some people were like, well, geez, Jim Harbaugh's throwing the ball a lot in the third and the fourth quarter. And I'm like, well, maybe that's a respect to the defensive line because they weren't able to gash them with big yardage running the football. So to me, and I said this before the season, this defense is going to be hard to judge. And you really can't judge them on numbers because they're going to be on the field a lot even when the offense is doing well or when the offense is not doing well because of the tempo, because of the pace. Um, but I like the fact that they're, they they seem to me, Jeff, uh, the much more aggressive, much more flying around than they even did last year. They seem much more disciplined at the same time from a standpoint. They're, they're willing to make plays. And you feel more optimistic, I think, moving forward, that this defense is capable of making plays. Uh, which was not the case last year. Yeah, I agree. Let's listen to uh, Coach Frost after the game talking about um, the passion and energy that UCF played with. We're getting better all the time. Um, I was thrilled with our energy, our passion, and our uh, our effort on Saturday. We played a really good team. Um, Michigan's a, a really talented team. They executed really well. Uh, but our guys went up there and fought. And... Uh, if we can keep that kind of energy and uh, enthusiasm and effort and, and keep adding execution to that, then, then I know this team will be happy at the end of the year. Well, that's a sharp departure from what we were used to hearing from George O'Leary. What was the game? Was it uh, a couple of years ago where, he, where O'Leary said, um, we expect our players to play with energy and passion, some of the same things that Frost was talking about? And he said, I saw none of it out there. <laughs> and o- O'Leary <laughs> said that after one game, we were like, wow, tell us how you really feel, Coach. Right. But yeah. um, but I-, I think this goes back to what we were talking about at the start of the year, which was this team, these players were desperate for something good to happen and for some confidence. And the coaches have bought into that and said, we're going to we're going to build up their confidence and make them feel like football players again, because the more confidence that they play with over time, the better they're going to play. And this next game against Maryland is going to be a test of that, isn't it? It is. And, you know, you played the clip about Scott Frost and how positive he was about the energy and how they played and how they were out. And then, you know, he talks about out hitting Michigan. And I think that's all part of the message. Hey, it's going to be okay. And I think that's the thing. He's going to be positive with his players, whereas, you know, George was not the case very positive with the players if they didn't play very well. So I think it's a it's a it's a shrewd move by Coach Frost. And I think you're gonna get that kind of message all year, no matter what happens. Because I think he he truly believes it's you gotta be positive. It's a it's a you know it's a process and it's about getting better. And uh look, you know, I we talked about this. I think the first two games, I don't think it, it, it's kind of what as I said I wasn't going to overreact to any of those two games. The first game against South Carolina State, you're facing an FCS team. So I wasn't going to overreact if you know by performing the way they performed. I wasn't going to overreact regardless of the Michigan game. Michigan's a top five team in the country. Uh, to me, starting this week, now we start to maybe figure out where is UCF football in 2016 uh, as far as the big picture. Where are they? Are they at a level of a Maryland team? Which you know, And it's an interesting game. Because Maryland, in some ways, is similar to UCF. Maryland is three and nine uh, last season. They obviously got rid of uh, Coach Itzel, and uh, they brought in DJ Durkin. Yeah, Randy uh, Itzel which, was fired after six games. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, and you know Maryland went like three and nine, and you know I think there's quest- serious questions whether I have that whether Maryland can compete in the Big Ten in football. Uh, but they're hoping that D.J. Durkin, who was just the defensive coordinator at Michigan, or obviously was a longtime defensive coordinator at Florida as well. Uh, you know, I'm interested. They they want to know how good they are. They don't know where they are. Now they, they, you know, they've looked pretty good. Uh, some people may have watched them the, this past week against FIU in Miami. The game was televised on CBS Sports Network. I caught glimpses of it, and they looked pretty athletic and pretty good. But again, um, you know, they played Howard, I think, before that. So we don't really have a gauge on how good Maryland is. And that's what I'm excited about, Jeff. I'm really excited about this game because I think I don't really know what to expect. And that's kind of exciting. And I think that should be exciting for night fans is we really don't know what to expect. And we don't, you know, what to gauge out of this game and where we stand. I don't think it's a defining game of the season or at all. But 
I think we start to figure out who's good, who's not good, what are we good at, what are we not good at, and that's exciting. Well, uh, here is uh, Coach Durkin discussing the similarities between his team and UCF under Scott Frost. The offense they were running there is very similar with what he's doing right now at Central Florida. I, I, I spent three years in the, in the Pac-12 when I was at Stanford, and, um, you know, he does a really good job. They're well coached. They, they you know, they're, they're up-tempo. Like I said, they, they create really good ways to run the football. Um, they take shots down the field and play action, and, um, you know, everywhere he's been, they've been very productive offensively, and, and uh, you know, so that, that's it's a big test for us on defense to, to limit that. Well, it's easy to say that. I mean, they've won their two games, like you mentioned, Eric, against Howard and FIU, averaging 46.5 points a game. Their rushing offense is off to a very good start right now. They're 14th in the nation at 277 yards a game through two weeks. They're averaging almost 500 yards in their first two games. So Now, granted, look at the opponents, uh, but still, those are some pretty impressive numbers that they've been putting up. But now they're going to face, I think, the toughest defense that they've faced yet, against UCF on the road um, and a team and a UCF team I think that's uh, now all of a sudden I think that there's a little bit of a chip on their shoulder after the Michigan game you know I was talking with the guys up in Gainesville uh, earlier this week uh, Mark McLeod and and his crew up at uh, up in Florida Sports Talk up in Gainesville and they seem to be um, you know, the outside of the UCF bubble The thought is, oh, boy, well, congratulations, you beat an FCS team, but you got thumped by Michigan. What are you going to say now? And um, I think that there might be a little bit of a chip on uh, UCF's shoulder saying, hey, we're not the team that got crushed by Michigan. We got a home game. We're better than we were last year. Watch this. Yeah, I think that's true. And, look, people are going to be skeptical uh, until this team proves they could win uh, multiple games. And that's, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, I think the Durkin – the interesting thing about it, and, and I didn't realize it until he mentioned it on the cl- uh, uh, in his presser that you just played, and that is D.J. Durkin and Scott Frost. Know, uh, you know they, they're familiar with, with each other back from the Pac-12 when Scott Frost yeah. was the with Oregon, and D.J. Durkin was part of the Stanford staff when Jim Harbaugh was there, and I think even then Coach Shaw as well. So um, that's interesting that they know each other. I didn't even think about that, but certainly Maryland. You know, uh, the radio voice, uh, play-by-play person, was on Tuck and O'Neill this week, and he talked about how Maryland's playing a lot of freshman players from D.J. Durkin's class. They're they're trying to make an immediate impact, kind of like Scott Frost is doing, uh, Jeff, as far as playing a bunch of freshmen and trying to make an impact on this program. And we saw that uh, with Adrian Killings, who probably, right, was the highlight so far of the season uh, with that long run. Well, you're not kidding. (laughs) which, Which, let's be honest, we didn't have that from any of the running backs uh, last season. And I think, and I said this before the season, I felt that the freshman running backs were uh, uh, would be the, the the top backs on this team. And you saw an example of that why, because they have that explosive ability that I don't think they had on the roster last year. Yeah, I I'm a, count me among those who watched that run by Adrian Killens. It was just a just a normal stretch play out of a shotgun formation. And when he got around the corner, that was it. He was gone. They weren't going to catch him. And I'm looking at that, and we know how fast he is. I mean, you know, he has world-class speed. And seeing that, I'm like, oh, man, this is going to be fun if we're going to be seeing a lot of this. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying not to get too excited, right? Uh, it's – but – that's the kind of speed that I don't think we've had at running back. Gosh, maybe going back to Kevin Smith, if not even longer before then, have we? Yeah, I think Kevin Smith, a very good comparison for that. I know some people in the audience might bring up, what about Latavius Murray? I never struck Latavius as the fastest explosive front. Now, Storm Johnson uh, had his moments, too, and he was fast. But I think Killings is faster mm. than him. Don't you? Oh, no question. Killens might be the fastest guy we've ever had on offense when you look back Could on be. it. Sure. Um, I mean, he was a track guy. I mean, no question. But I would say, yeah, Kevin Smith is probably was a home run hitter. I think Storm was close. But, I, yeah, I agree. I would say since Kevin Smith, for at least, uh, was the fastest guy. Uh, so that's, a, that's the exciting thing about this is, you know, seeing these freshman guys like Killings on the field, getting experience, and you realize, hey, you know, we're, they're, they're heading in the right direction. I mean, I don't know what that means from a win-loss record this season, Jeff. Well, there's only one way to go after last year. <laughs> sure, right. You know, 
And but I, I just I think I, I'd like the athletes, even the freshmen, you could see that that there's definitely talent now up there from a freshman class. And I think you feel good that remember, I mean, he's gonna have another freshman class after this upcoming recruiting year and all that. So I think that's the thing that's encouraging is you're you're starting to see the athletes back where, where it was. Uh because I think I definitely believe that in the running back position there was a drop off in, in the last couple of years there. And I'll say this, the offensive line, which you have been very critical of the last two or three years, from a running standpoint, I thought a run blocking standpoint, I thought looked pretty good, like you talked about. So, uh, again, interesting to see what they do against the Maryland team. I will say this, other than maybe Houston, I don't think there's another team on the schedule that UCF will face that is as talented as Michigan or as physical as Michigan Uh, from a line of scrimmage and skill position standpoint. So keep that in mind, too, when people kind of react to this, uh, that performance. Uh, And I'm a believer that playing competition like that will make you better. And I think UCF is a better football team for playing that game and going and going up to Ann Arbor. There's nothing they're going to see the rest of the year that that should really say, wow, we haven't seen that before. No, you're right, and I think that also Maryland is the right opponent right now at the right time for UCF, a Big Ten team, power power conference team that's also struggling trying to figure out what their identity is too. Best part is we get them at home, and uh, even though they're 2-0, and they've done so against uh, significantly weaker opponents, I think weaker than UCF is right now and probably will be by the end of the season. One thing I'm concerned about, though, Eric, is the passing game. And I think a lot of UCF fans share that concern. Justin Holman and Nick Patty last week were a combined 6 of 22, but they were both 3-4-11 uh, in that game. UCF finished with a grand net total of 56 passing yards, um, giving up 328, You know, obviously, but Michigan had a field day throwing the football. But um, the passing game was a real struggle, and Coach Frost made no bones about that fact in the postgame presser. In our passing game in general, our protection needs to be better. Our routes need to be crisper and more defined, and our, our quarterbacks need to make better decisions and, and hit some of them. Um, yeah, I don't think it'll be as hard every week in and week out as it was against Michigan. They got some special players, uh, a couple exceptional linebackers and some uh, DBs that are really good. And, um, you know, it'll get a little bit easier, but if we can learn to execute it at, in a way that – we can beat Michigan, then we'll be able to complete balls on everybody else. Well, yeah, it's going to have to get better than six for 22, uh, and that's something that they're going to work. Now, Holman got hurt on a scramble uh, in the second quarter of that game. Um, there's still some – He's as of the rec- this recording, Frost is still mum on his status. I think that if uh, he doesn't play – Well, if he does play, he's going to be hampered in terms of the running, which is going to be a problem, I think, for UCF offensively. If he doesn't play and they have to hand the the reins over to Nick Patty, I don't think that's as bad as people think it's going to be. Uh, Patty looked pretty good in that half a series that he played. I know it was against South Carolina State, but it looked like he was getting the ball out a little bit more quickly than Holman, who tends to wind up a little bit more. And if Frost's M.O. this week is to prepare Nick Patty to play, to start and to play, um, that's not so bad, handing it off to a guy who uh, who is a pretty good runner himself, good enough to be used as sort of a slash guy uh, when UCF was desperate last year, and, uh, and also a guy who's a senior and has been around this program for three years. He's not the fresh newcomer who transferred over from Boise that he was when he first started out. At UCF, I know he was a local kid, went to Dr. Phillips, but um, I think that if you give Patty a week to prepare as a senior running this offense, that might not turn out as bad as people think. What do you think? I agree. Um, you know, Justin, you know, going back to even the South Carolina State game. Jeff, that first half, think, he struggled. Right. I think he ended up being something like 14 of 28. So. Mm-hmm. It's not like he has been the most accurate quarterback in his career. Um, so it's not like this is just happening. Uh, I will be shocked if we know who the quarterback is up until kickoff. I think Scott Frost, and he's done a wonderful job of not 
giving you any idea what's going on. And I don't have a problem with that. I don't want to play poker what? with him ever. Right. I, I, it's a fantastic job. And, and you know what? Good for him. Why should he tell anybody? I don't I mean to me. You this is your use this to your advantage. I mean, I could tell you Maryland has no idea what to expect. So now Maryland is going to be prepared. They're, you know, they're going to prepare for both Holman and Patty and regardless of what happens. So I, I think he's done a very good job with that. I've been very impressed uh, because I have no I don't think anybody will have any idea leading into maybe warm ups on Saturday. You know, hey, and people will see, well, is Justin dressed up, dressed if he's not dressed, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't even know what to expect. But I do agree with you. I, I will say this. I would not be surprised regardless if you see two quarterbacks play in this game. Because let's say, let's say hypothetically, let's say Justin Holman plays. You're right. Maybe he's not 100 percent. Maybe they bring in Nick Patty to run some plays with his legs that maybe they don't want Justin to do. Or maybe if Nick Patty starts, do they bring in another quarterback, a Kruzak, for example? Uh, do they bring in a Milton, obviously, who has been regarded as the future of the program? I personally don't think they will bring him in. Oh, God, but I you hope never they know. don't. <laughs> right, I, but you, I mean, yeah. but, but you, you see what I'm saying. I, I, I think Kruzak's the better likelihood of the one of the two freshmen that they would play. And I don't even know if Kruzak is necessarily healthy enough to play. I don't even think he traveled to Ann Arbor. But nonetheless, you know, I, I, I think it's all kind of up in the air. And I think that's kind of intriguing to me. I like the way the way Scott's playing this. And I think I don't. I, right. I mean, would you be I would be shocked if we knew who the quarterback is up, a, you know, like before an hour before kickoff. Like I, I would be shocked if it came out. I, now, you know, hey, look, maybe somebody has got good sources and they could leak it. But I have a sense with this staff that nothing's getting out. Do you? Yeah, I have the same sense, too. You know, uh, the coaching staff under George O'Leary leaked like a sieve because he was <laughs> yes. there for a while. Um, yeah. Scott's smart. He's going to play things close to the vest. And, and if I was in his position, I would do the same thing. I wouldn't want anyone knowing who was taking the field, preferably until we had to, until we were, had to put the offense out there. Correct. Um, and, that, and that might be the case. Yeah. I mean, that he might – I wonder – would he go to – let's say Justin wasn't available. Would he make him dress anyway just to make people think that he was available? Oh, I mean, I, that else? would be a smart move you know? if he did. Oh, I yeah, would do that. Right. I mean, that's – I've seen that happen before. I'm excited about it personally. I can't wait. I mean, that's um, – I'm excited. And I actually believe that uh, regardless of who the quarterback is, I think he's going to have some – uh, some tricks up his sleeve. I think there's going to be some things they're going to have ready to go with the offense, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated to see how this plays out. But I agree. I don't. I don't. I don't think anything's going to leak. I don't think anybody's going to know about this. Um, and to me, I, there's no reason for them to announce anything until uh, literally you get to kickoff. It's not like the NFL where there's a guideline where you have to come out on Fridays and say if this guy's questionable, is he doubtful, and stuff like that. You don't have to do that in college. College, uh, you literally don't have to announce anything until the guy go, go, goes under center for the first snap, like you said. So yeah. uh, it might it might be a nightmare for like media people and broadcasters, but like, they don't. We got to okay. deal with it. <laughs> we exactly. got to deal with it. Deal with it. You know, so that's fun. So I, I don't know. I, I that's the thing, and that's why it's going to be hard for me to even predict this Maryland game. And, and to be honest, I'm going to just give you. I'm going to be upfront with you. I'm going to be copping out and say I have no idea what to expect. And one of the reasons why I have no idea who's going to be the quarterback, and 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 and, and that's exciting. Uh, unfor you know, last year, Jeff, I feel like towards especially after the Furman game, I kind of felt like yeah, and then especially against the Connecticut game. Actually, it was after the Connecticut game. So I actually was a little optimistic about the Connecticut game because I believe that was when Justin Holman came back from his injury. Mm -hmm. After the Connecticut game, right, I think we all kind of saw the writing on the wall where it's like, yeah, uh, th this season's long this gone. Is, yeah, this season's lost. For me, it was the Furman game. That was pretty sure. much where it was like, oh, boy, this is going to be a long year. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. First four games non-conference, you're playing two Big Ten opponents – an FCS opponent, and then FIU at FIU before you get to conference play. Right. I think most reasonable people are saying, all right, UCF gets to conference play at 2-2. Two and two. Their head's above water at that point. So let me ask you this. 
is is this Maryland game oh god I don't want to ask you if it's a must win but is UCF going to treat this like a conference game in terms of the quality of the opponent defending the home field and all that because if you let's face it if they knock off Maryland and then go down to Miami and beat FIU all of a sudden you're you're sitting at 3 and 1 and you're only losses to a top 5 team right so at that point you're you're playing with house money so what do you think you think they treat this like a conference game Oh, absolutely. I, I, yeah, I know, and I know what you're referring to because I know in the past uh, with George O'Leary, there was accusations of him not treating the mark the non-conference games very important. Yeah, I remember you know, that game infamous, in uh, that the Texas game in Austin. The comes infamous to mind. Texas game, the infamous Texas game in 2009, and our friend David he, Bauman who had to deal oh, with the wrath of O'Leary. I remember that. That was uh, that was fun. That was funny. That was for, for people, the audience that doesn't re- know or remember. UCF was going into Texas. Uh, the long that was Colt McCoy in Texas. Yeah. They were ranked number two in the country, and it was Huge late game. in the season too. It was this unusual late season yeah. non conference game. It was, and the week after UCF was hosting then national ranked Houston with Case Keenum at the quarterback, Kevin Sumlin, and there was report rumors that Brett Hodges, who was the quarterback for UCF at the time. And was not going to play the Texas game. And I believe Brent Harvey, right, the running back, was not going to play in that game, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And David Bauman, who was working at Bright House Sports Network at the time, reported that. He found, he, 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 you know, was able to get it through a source. And did his job. He reported the truth. And he did report the truth. It was accurate. And I'm, and I, and what was funny is I remember, I think he actually broke the story. He Obviously, he broke it on, on the on Bright House Sports there, but I think that day he was actually filling in on Tuck and O'Neill because Jerry O'Neill was obviously the sideline reporter uh, for UCF and was with the team in Austin. And then, of course, David Bauman flew to Austin to cover the game or, or afterwards or something like that. I don't remember. I mean, actually, maybe he wasn't doing Tuck and O'Neill. I don't remember. But nonetheless, he was in Austin, and George was living with him. <laughs> and there's like I think the video See, yeah, came out. Yeah, there was. Yeah, but he's out of here in the post game press conference. He's out of here. Get him out of here. And then to David's credit, he stood up to O'Leary and said, "Hey, coach, I was doing my job. I'm That's, not going anywhere. Yeah, I'm not right. going anywhere. I did my I did my job. That's not. And it wasn't David's fault that that happened. He was doing his job. But that just shows you the the disdain Correct. that O'Leary had for the press in general. Um, sure. Which. Now, it's funny. You, you talk about Scott Frost now, kind of switching gears a little bit. By the way, quick story. I'm about to wrap up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Because uh, now I remember Bowman was not doing the radio show. He, I think he was calling in from Austin, I think, or something like that. But anyway, so UCF ended up losing the game to Texas. They don't play Brent Harvey. They don't play uh, or they don't play Brent Hodges. They, they, a couple guys who were, quote, nipped, uh, banged up. They do come back and play against Houston the following week. And they beat Houston. They upset yeah. Houston. Hodges plays. I mean, it was a huge game for and Ray that Harvey. that was UCF's first ever win over a Correct. top 25 ranked team. And I was there on the sideline for that game. I was uh, there as well. It was a great win. And, and I actually defended George at the time because, yeah, the Houston game was a bigger game than Texas. And Texas, that was a long shot game. The difference is, the difference is, Scott Frost is building a program. Yeah. You know, George had already built the program, and obviously it would even get better as time went on. Scott's trying to build this program, and I think he wants – he's trying – he's still learning about who can play on this team, who does he trust. So I, I think when you're in a building process, you're not thinking about, well, I'm just going to treat the – I think you're treating this game uh, full gear because you're this team is trying to get better and trying to learn the system. So that's why I believe – that uh, this game will – yes, it's very important to them. Not the must win, not a must win, but but it is a gauge on where are you as a football team in 2016 moving forward. Yeah, the revisionist history, I think, of that uh, Texas game is O'Leary did the right thing. David Bauman did his job. They were both right. The way right. O'Leary treated Bauman at the time, I think, yeah, that was, was wrong. wrong. That was- now, now, what's interesting and what I was – and. Back to the point that I was going to make before was we're starting to learn that, you know, with the UCF Nights Talk uh, radio show that's happening over at Caddyshanks now, which is great. Um, and also we learned from the the press conference media ability or media availability early in the week. You yeah. know, Scott does keep it close to his vest. He really doesn't say much. 
And I don't think it's because, like O'Leary, he has any disdain for the press. I just think that it's, you know, he's he's kind of a, a rookie at this. He's a little bit uncomfortable. There were some reports that he was a little terse with the press um, when he was in Eugene um, as the offensive coordinator for Oregon. Um, but it's another one of those things where he's going to be fine as time goes by. Um, but his primary concern, you know, I think right now, I mean, obviously he's there for the press conference availability. That's, that's our prime, um, that's our prime concern as members of the media, right? I mean, do, you know, do that and you're fine. The, 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 uh, you know, the, the unicorns and rainbows, you know, radio show live at some bar somewhere, you know, and okay, you know, if you're not doing it every, you know, every week, then, you know, hand the spotlight off to somebody else. Lord knows there's a lot of other co- great coaches at UCF who can steal some of the sure. spotlight. But uh, I, I don't think it's because he has any disdain for the press. I just think that he's, you know, he's not used to it. Um, and this being a, more of a metro media market than a college town media market, the media atmosphere is a lot different. Um but I think that he'll become more comfortable, and 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 it's and it's not like and the also the other thing too is like, it's not like UCF and us here in the Orlando market are, you know, the hard hitting New York types. Right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, let's be, let's be real here, um, and uh, and so I don't think that it's much of a I don't think that it's much to be concerned about I, it, at the end. You know, like you're saying. The primary objective this year is to win football games, correct, and correct. Give the, and give the players some some confidence. And I think as time goes by, we'll see more and more of uh, Scott Frost doing media. Excuse me, doing well, uh, I, media appearances. Well, number one, I mean, it's his first year, and it's he's never been a head coach before, which has more responsibilities with the media than you do when you're an offense coordinator. So there's an adjustment period. I think you've seen that with a lot of coaches. I mean, Jimbo Fisher, for example, at Florida State, is a lot more open with the media now than he was, say, his first year or two at Florida State when he was being compared to Nick Saban. So uh, part of it is, you know, time. Also, keep in mind, Scott Frost comes from Oregon. We coached under Chip Kelly and Mark Helfrich. The Oregon way is they don't like to give much to the media. And, you know, because of the offense, because, you know, even with the uniforms, everything's kept secret. They don't want, you know, and and part of that is how to play. Yeah, he learned how to play poker from some pretty good poker players up there. And, and, And remember who he played for, Tom Osborne. Again, if you look at Tom Hos- Osborne's history, not going to give you much. Yeah, probably the most boring media coach in sure. history, Tom Osborne. Correct. So, And I think it's by design. Uh, and let's be honest, there's a lot of coaches that don't want to give media a lot of stuff because they don't want to give away information. They don't want to give away game plans. They don't want to – that's why a lot of practices are closed even in the spring or in the summer. So, um, you know, as far as the coaches show – I think you can make an argument that the old coaches show, college coaches show of coaches doing the entire 60 minutes at a bar and taking calls from fans and stuff. I feel that's kind of archaic, don't you? It's kind of become yeah. real. I mean, Jimbo Fisher still does that at Florida State. But, for example, Jim McElwain doesn't do his show every week at Florida. They don't even – in fact, they call it Gator Talk. It's the same concept, which is – he do, Jim McElwain does certain big. Uh, he'll come on before big games, like you know, because obviously mm-hmm. there's a lot of interest in those games and stuff like that. Uh, Hurricane Hotline down in Miami. Mark Rick uh, is only uh, does not do every show, and now you know they've decided where yes, in those shows, they'll bring in the the athletic director, or they'll bring in a player, or they might bring in a coordinator, or they might bring a coach from another sport to promote other stuff to fill an hour because. Now with the technology, Jeff, I mean, if you're a fan of a, your program, like you, if let's say you're, you're, if you're a UCF fan, which is obviously the audience that's listening to this podcast right now, you probably already know what Scott Frost is going to say. Like you already know what Scott Frost thinks because you've probably watched his press conference on Monday, which is now available online on UCFnights.com. Or you maybe listen to his post game on the radio after the Michigan game. It's not like it was 20 years ago when the coaches show was really the only time you could hear your coach talk about your team, uh, you know, in a setting, you know, for the upcoming game. Agreed. Now, now they can see it. So I, I, I actually, uh, I've listened to the coaches show and I kind of like it because 
you can only talk so much about your team for 60 minutes straight. And again, there's still coaches that do that. I'm not saying there's a wrong answer either way. If you want to do a full coaches show, 60 minutes, good for you. I mean, and Jimbo does a very good job. And I think Jimbo has followed the tradition of what Bobby Bowden was doing. And remember, that's in Tallahassee, too. Yeah. So there's a lot of, you know, that's the only game in town. Like you brought up in Orlando, that's not necessarily the case. And I think from Scott's standpoint, I don't need to be on the whole time. You know what? It's okay if if my if Kevin Smith is on for a segment. It's okay if Danny White, uh, who is on in the most recent episode of their coaches talk, I, uh, is just as interesting because now there's other interesting aspects of the program that people are interested that goes beyond what goes on the field. So I, I don't have a personal problem with that. Uh, and I would say the same thing, by the way, about the coaches show on television. I think that even more than the radio show is more archaic now because – Again, you don't need the coach on television to recap that game. You could probably get the recap right after the game. Yeah, you're right. I think that the traditional coaches show is going the way of the dinosaur. Yeah, the funny part is, like, I used to produce Bobby Bowden's coaches show when I worked for um, WORL when it was a sports station, 660 AM around here. And he used to have, like, this, like, he knew who the callers were. It's like some old lady <laughs> in, you know, Madison <laughs> County. Uh, right. You know, call the coach Bowden. And I, I called in last year and it was so great to talk to you and it's great to talk to you again. And I didn't have a question. I just wanted to say hi to you. And, and Coach Bowden, of course, you know, playing, the, you know, the guy that he was. Well, it's always great to talk to you, Marlene, you know, and the whole thing. And I'm like and I'm sitting here listening to this. I'm like, I'm like Gene Deckerhoff must must want to fall off of his stool in, in, in wherever it is that they're recording this show, because it was. It was kind of ridiculous. And now, you know, you're right. We're a much more um, – we know more. We have access to more than ever, unfiltered, by the way. So, um, yeah, I, I do like the fact that you can now put the spotlight on guys like, you know, obviously the athletic director, Danny White, who's going to have a lot more to say about fan experience, which is really what the point of that show is, interaction with Correct. the fans. Um, UCF yeah, heroes you know. like, you know, Kevin Smith before and – you know, you can have guys like Sean Becton and Travis Fisher on, some of the other offensive coaches as well. And the thing that we hope that we like to see a little bit more of is some of the coaches of the, the other sports who've got some big uh, events coming yeah. up, and they can promote those as well. You know, we, let's bring on Tiffany roberts Hadak. Let's bring on Brian Cunningham and Todd Dagenet, and and uh, you can highlight some of the, the new coaches coming in in the spring too, John Roddick, for example. Uh, yeah. And that, and that I think is that's how that how much more useful that platform can be. I agree 100 percent with that. I think you're going to see that more of that with the basketball show, too, with uh, Johnny Dawkins. I would expect to see Coach Abe, yeah. the women's basketball team will be or probably be involved in that. And I would like to see the other coaches involved as well. I think that's absolutely correct, Jeff. And I have no problem with that. And you're right. I mean, let's be honest. The coaches traditional show. I mean, like when if you listen to the George O'Leary radio show the last few years and even if you've listened to the first oh, few episodes awful. this year. Well, yeah. O'Leary is O'Leary, but it was like our, my buddy Corey was always the only one that would ask call in or, or even be at the show and call and ask a question. So it's always the same deal. And then, you know, um, you're right. I think the majority of it, if you want to know what your coaches think, you can pretty much access. And I think the schools want you to go to UCF night.com. Go check out what Scott Frost has to say on the post in his pregame or Monday pressers or stuff like that. So uh, I think all these schools now want, you to come to their site and come to their platform to get the information. And it is much more accessible. And um, I think that's the name of the game. So I, I agree. I don't have a problem with it. I don't, I really don't. And, and he's, he's got a job to do. And a thing that struck me, and I believe it was at the fan fest before the season started, there was other teams from UCF there involved. I think the there was a representation from women's soccer. There was representation from volleyball, like the players were there and stuff like that. Men's soccer, which was never the case when uh, George was there, it was all about the football. And so that's which been is very exactly what he the way he wanted it too. He wanted to have know. nothing to do with any other sport. And you would know that you work there. So uh, I think it's been refreshing and I, I'm pleased with that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I saw Scott Frost and Coach Frost this year, went to a couple of softball games my, uh, there. So uh, I, I'm all for it. And I've enjoyed the program. And actually, to be honest, I was, you know, I've listened to it and uh, it, it's 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 good UCF talk for UCF fans. Yeah. So. All right. Prediction at gunpoint, Maryland game. No, Go. no, no. You're not going to get me to do it. No, yes, man, I, I don't Come know. On. 
I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I think I think it's going to be a good game. And, uh, I, you know, depending on where you check, I guess Maryland's, what, nine and a half, ten point favorite? I might be inclined to take UCF. And that's as, I'll leave it as that. It opened at nine in favor of Maryland. It's got, depending on where you look at, Caesars has it at nine. Westgate has it at eight and a half. Uh, I will take UCF to co- I would take UCF to cover in this game because of you know just the fact that they're playing at home. Um, I think they're going to come out ready to play. And uh, Maryland, by the way, o for o and two on the over under. So oh, uh, there you go. That's a completely useless statistic for you. Over under this game is fifty nine. So um, I'm. I'm hoping we stay with him. I think it'll be close. I think it'll be close. I don't. I like to category, categorize games as definite UCF win, definite UCF loss, or toss up. I think this game's a toss up. Last I week hope, was a I, definite I, I, UCF loss. This game's right. a toss up. I just hope it's a good football game. Uh, I mean, I know that's very cliche. I really do. I I just feel like this will be a good football game, like a good time, you know. And and you know, that sounds very. Uh, I mean, compared to last year, Jeff. I mean. I mean, that's a good thing. You know, we didn't get to see good football games last year. So I, I, I'm excited about it. I really am. I'm genuinely excited about this football game. Uh, I don't know what to expect. I expect a good environment, too. Uh, it's family weekend. Yeah. Uh, a lot of events going on. Um, you know, it's, and Maryland's a good opponent. I mean, I, you know, are they not? They're not a marquee team, but I can tell you I've been to Maryland. I went to a Maryland football game. As a matter of fact, I've been to their home game. Beautiful right, campus, UCF. by the way. Yes, yes. I got to visit the campus. I recommend any UCF fan next year if they when they they're scheduled to play at Maryland, uh, when you know when they're scheduled to play at Maryland, I would recommend that trip. It's a very fun trip and a very good stadium. If the game is a noon game, I would definitely de- uh, hydrate because it's very hot. Because mm-hmm. I went for a noon game and it was brutal, but uh, it was fun and and it's a great area and a great university. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to it, and it'll be cool. And uh, I hope it's a very good game for everybody. All right. Stick around. We're going to, when we get back, we'll talk about some of the other sports going on at UCF, including our last volleyball tournament of the uh, season before they start conference play. Stick around. This is the Black and Gold Banner at Podcast. Back after this. Hello, Night Nation. This is Andrew Fegley. This is Trey Strelka with the UCF Nightline Podcast, the original, the number one rated UCF sports podcast. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. On Twitter, it's UCF underscore Nightline and at www.ucfnightlinepodcast.com. Be sure to subscribe to us as well on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. And when you get sick of listening to these guys, make sure you look us up. Don't forget, that's the UCF Nightline Podcast. Go Knights! Charge on. Now, back to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. All right, welcome back to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez back with you here. Let's talk a little about what's going on outside of football in UCF land. And uh, I want to start with volleyball, who had a big weekend uh, last weekend at the Holiday Inn Orlando East UCF Classic. It was a big Friday for the Knights as they uh, knocked off FAU in four and had a huge match against LSU that evening, coming in from the Southeastern Conference LSU rebuilding this year. Traditionally a very good uh, SEC volleyball squad under Coach Fran Flory. UCF pushed LSU to five sets on the home floor, but then the bottom fell out in the fifth set as the Knights fall um, three to two in that match. Fifteen uh, five in the final set, which was kind of a, which was kind of a bummer because UCF had fallen down two to one. Uh, fought back in a in a very intense fourth set to to force that fifth set, and uh, but but unfortunately just nothing went right for the Knights in that fifth set. Now the key though, two days later the Knights had a Saturday match to wrap up the tournament or a Sunday match rather to finish up the tournament against Seattle, and they came through with the sweep. The Knights did to finish out the tournament two and one, and I thought that that was key for Coach Dagenay's team to. Uh, get through to to recover from that LSU loss. I felt like last year's team when the injury bug hit and all that um the Sunday match felt like a match that they would have lost and they were challenged by Seattle in the first set 25-23 and they were challenged by them in, in the third. They were hard to put away in that match, but uh they end up coming up with the victory and uh UCF volleyball right now standing at 7 and 3, 5 and 2 on the home floor. 
and they got the uh, another tournament coming up this weekend, Eric. But uh, you were at the LSU match with me. What were your impressions? I guess I'll take the blame for the loss, right? <laughs> I was there for the one loss. So don't ever come uh, back. Yeah, right. Don't come back, Coach. Won't want me. Look, I thought it was a great match. First of all, you mentioned them coming back in the fourth set. What you didn't mention is UCF was down eleven to five. In that fourth set, like it looked like they were going to be done in four sets. It was a controversial point that I'll let you expand on. No, nope, I'm not going set. to. I don't want to get in trouble. Are you going to get fined or something? Well, there was a call that went against UCF in the third set that uh, it was at was a very... pivotal moment in the match. Right. I mean, can you explain the... what it was? Yeah, it, what was it? It exactly? was a. Uh, it was a. It looked there was a ball that was that looked like it was down. One of the judges ruled it down, but he was overruled by one of the uh, officials on either side of the net. And it's tough for it's tough to do this, you know. Now in college volleyball, at the uh, in the power conferences, they have the replay system that they can go take a look at with these kinds of things. They don't, obviously UCF doesn't have that just yet, um, but it was. Uh, but Coach Dagenet for uh, for a moment there was beside himself. Uh, I totally understood where he was coming from, but the Knights lost the point. But that was a critical point in the match because after that, um, they just played angry and uh, and and forced the fifth set. And I felt like when they got there, they're like, "All right, now we're here to the fifth set." And then LSU right. jumped out, I think five nothing in the fifth, and then that was pretty much that. Yeah, LSU and LSU did. And that's a good team. No, don't, don't make yeah. listen. Make no bones about it. LSU is a good team. They're very young. They're relatively yes. undersized for an SEC team right now. Correct. But they've got some good hitters on that team, and uh, they showed why they're LSU volleyball, and they're coached by Fran Flory, who's one of the best in the country, and yeah. uh, and they came away with the win. Give them more power to them, you know? Yeah, no, it was a great match to watch. I mean, the thing I was impressed is UCF came back. You mentioned and the reason I brought up that controversial point in the third set is they lost a very tight third set. And a lot of teams would have just kind of gone away in the fourth set. And it looked like that was the direction we were headed with UCF trailing, falling behind 11 to five. But they fought back and won a dramatic fourth set to even force the fifth. And I thought that showed a lot of growth and a lot of fight from this team. And you mentioned they come back on Sunday and beat Seattle, a team, by the way, that beat UCF last year in Miami. So. Uh, that's a good win. I thought it was a good tournament and a good positive sign of the growth of this team. There's no question this team is better than it's been in the last uh, last year. And, you know, it's, it's as I've said before, it's about getting ready for the conference. It's an automatic bid to the regular season champion, and you're trying to put yourself in that position where you can compete right there with the top teams. And I think it's a wide-open league, and UCF feels they're just as big of a contender as anybody else. So I thought it was a very positive step. I know Coach Dagenet and Coach Jenny Marr didn't want to hear that after the match. Right. Um, they were disappointed with, like you, I think, with the fifth set. But I thought the team uh, bounced back like they thought they would, and I think it shows the character and the competitiveness of this of this group. And uh, I'm excited for this team and what it could accomplish this season, Jeff. Because uh, I, I still think their best volleyball is still ahead of them, don't you? Yeah, I think so. I, 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 and I really want to see how they perform this week against three teams that are um, tougher than everyone thinks. You know, have har- higher RPIs certainly last year than uh, than people think in uh, this week's tournament, the uh, UC, the uh, Holiday Inn Orlando East UCF Challenge. Um, two matches on Friday: one against UNC Asheville at uh, noon. Uh, and then the other nightcap Friday night, come on out for Central Arkansas. Central Arkansas is actually a pretty good team. Uh, that's at 7.30 on Friday. And then that leads into the uh, tournament finale on uh, Saturday. It's going to be a busy day of sports on campus on Saturday. Check this out. UCF men's soccer, who uh, unfortunately fell tonight to Florida Gulf Coast 3-1 to in their home opener and have had two games canceled this year. One at Charlotte and one at Mercer. Um, right now, standing at uh, I'm just rolling through here. Owen uh, three on the season. They get a shot at Jacksonville on Saturday at noon at the UCF Track and Soccer Complex. So I know it's going to be busy on campus, a lot of tailgating. But come on out for the game. Uh, you can come on out for the game. Catch men's soccer against Jacksonville at noon. 
go out, tailgate for a little while, come back into the venue. It gets a little hot out there, 4 p.m. UCF Volleyball in the venue, that's the old arena, against Central Michigan to finish out the uh, tournament. That's at 4 p.m. And then that dovetails right into UCF in Maryland. So you got a full day on campus of uh, wow. UCF sports, huh? That's a triple header. I like it. I mean, I've done that, too. Where I love that. I, I just love having sports going on because you get that spillover crowd. Um, the yes. soccer's fun. You can, you know, and then after the soccer is over, hey, you can go back and hang out. You know, the, guy, the folks over in the RVs can come on over to the track and soccer complex. You know, if it's a little bit hot in the afternoon and you're thinking, oh, let's go inside and catch a little volleyball, you can come on in. It's going to get loud in there. And I think that that's uh, – I love that UCF did that. You know, in the past, they, for some reason, sometimes they would schedule things across from each other. And, right. And the, uh, and the folks who do the scheduling for UCF and the facilities, David Hansen and the like, they do a great job. They've done a great job of late of staggering these schedules on these multi-sport days to give fans an opportunity to kind of trickle in and uh, and see what's going on and uh, and catch a little UCF volleyball when they might not might not normally uh, be on campus to do so. So uh, I hope that works out for the nights on Saturday at soccer and at volleyball. I do. Th- I think, and I think it will. I've done that. I've done that where I have swung by volleyball before heading over inside for football. So it, and it's very doable. Volleyball is a fast match. So let's, you know, the match could be done by six, six thirty. You could still have plenty of time to get in. So it's a, it's a, it's a busy day. And I, I enjoy those days. I'm cra- You know, I, I enjoy that. And, and, and the student athletes deserve that. And, uh, that's fun. That that's a fun weekend. And you're right. This is again, a very important home stretch for volleyball with conference right around the corner here, Jeff. So, but I was encouraged having watched them in person, uh, that I think that the, the, the future is bright. And I think this team has got a shot to contend for the conference. It's a wide open conference with a much improved conference too. Yeah. Since the natty is very good with maybe the best player in the conference and Jordan Thompson, you got temple. It's very good. Uh, you've got the, the South Florida is very good. So, I mean, it's very good competition. I really do recommend, uh, if you get a chance, go out there for volleyball I like what they're doing with the the volleyball venue too, Jeff, which you have discussed before in the past in the podcast and with kind of what they're doing around the venue now to really make it an intimate volleyball venue with the, some of the upgrades they're doing over there. Yeah, it's um, – remember, it's half of what the old arena used to be. You know, the stands that went up above the concourse are blocked off and are now basketball practice facilities. But uh, you found that out for the LSU match. When it, when it gets – when it gets – it gets going in there. It's a rowdy joint, man. It gets loud in there. And if you have a and, – and I think – and that LSU match wasn't even a sellout, believe it or not. If you can get a sellout in that place like we've done before with um, right. you know matches against Stanford in the past and USF in particular, sure. man, it's, it's a, it can get nuts in there. No question. And uh, I think it will. And I think they'll, uh, it'll be, that'll be interesting. And I think the, girl, the t- players will feed off of that, too, which is a big yes. home-court advantage. That's so. the most important part right there. Because I think that it, the, in that LSU match in particular, what pushed UCF to five in that match was that the fans kind of – the fans got angry, too. And, and the players fed off of that. Um, and I think that's key. I hope they get a good crowd for that match against well, uh, Central Michigan. And it's a great facility – for recruiting as well. I yes. mean, you can go in and bring a kid there. You look at last year, the high state high school championships were held there. So mm-hmm. Tanya Jarvis, uh, former UCF uh, volleyball yep. player herself, uh, clinched a state title for Bishop Moore on the floor that she used wow. to play on when she was here. That's pretty cool. And I believe Aaron Campbell, who was a former UCF volleyball player, was commentating for Bright House yeah. Sports Network. So a lot of volleyball UCF ties there. But, uh, yeah, no, looking forward to that. But you're right. It was a very, I thought it was a successful weekend for volleyball. Even the LSU loss, I know it was disappointing for the group. But, I mean, that could have gone either way. And I think they'll learn from that. And uh, moving forward, you hope uh, interesting to see how they come out this weekend. And I think that Saturday game will be a challenge because – from a volleyball player, there's a, there's distractions that weekend because everybody, you know, the, it's going to be a busy campus, a lot of things going on. You know, it's going to be hard focused. to park. <laughs> yeah, you, you, yeah, yeah, that's you. That's a you problem there. Yeah, no, I got a parking uh, pass for that match. I'm not going to have any problem. I'll be getting into I'll that be, garage nice and easy. <laughs> well, maybe we. All right, maybe you and I should talk then. Um, but yeah, no, it's going to be a fun atmosphere, and uh, but that's big for the players to focus on that because sometimes you can get distracted with all the distractions and lose focus. I'll be interested to see Jeff in that Saturday match if they uh, they lock in there. Speaking of distractions, 
men's soccer this year has just had a spate of bad luck. Um, lost their opener out in Phoenix to Grand Canyon. Had a game canceled against Charlotte because of a hurricane. Lost in a tough game at South Carolina. Then had their most, what was supposed to be their most recent match on Sunday, September the 11th, canceled at Mercer. So they're in mid-September having only played two games. Uh, tonight they fall in their home opener, very late home opener, to uh, Florida Gulf Coast. It's a pretty good team, but I'm sure they're disappointed about that result, 3-1 to one tonight. Um, but they got to get off the schneid real quick because they've got Jacksonville coming in on Saturday at noon uh, as well. So if you can make it out to that game, make sure you do. And then after that, it's next Wednesday uh, against North Florida, UNF, on September 21st. And then September 24th, a week from Saturday, conference play starts up against USF at home. So uh, this, is, this is a weird, weird state, uh, you know, state of affairs for uh, Brian Cunningham's team right now. The good news is he's home for a while. Like he yeah. does not have to get on a plane until October when One, they go two, to Memphis. One, two, three, so. four, five, five straight, five more yeah. home matches, uh, excluding this one tonight: Jacksonville, UNF, uh, USF, that's SMU, Wednesday night, and then folks, a, and the then a Northwestern. By the way, that's just Wednesday night. Yeah, when we're we taping record. this for on those that Wednesday are tuning night. in. If you're wondering, if you're listening on like Friday, you're like, "Wait, what does he mean tonight? What are you talking about?" When he's listening on Wednesday morning, that's what he that, that's what he meant. But yeah, yes. podcasts enable you to journey through space and time like that. So, <laughs> yeah. So no, look, that's the good news is after all the you know, like you mentioned, all the the weird stuff that's going on with the traveling and the scheduling and all that, they're going to be home for a while, and I think that's a good thing for this team. And a good way to kind of try to figure them who they are, because I'm sure they don't yeah. know yet who they are because they haven't had enough uh, the, the games that they thought they would have yet to know who they are. So that's the good news is they're going to be home for a while in their own dorms and, and places and and, and just kind of figure out what they need to work on and get better and uh, get ready for conference because it's going to I mean, that's a tough conference slate to start with South Florida is a very good t- team, a team that's been a top 25 program in men's soccer. And then SMU has been a power in men's soccer. So it's not like it's an easy start to the conference schedule. So I think you look at that Jacksonville and North Florida, I think are very important matches for Coach Cunningham and his team to kind of grow as a team and and get some confidence and yeah. get better in, some, in certain areas that they've been struggling with and uh, get ready for conference. Yeah, got to protect the home field in these upcoming uh, non-conference matches as he head into conference play. Women's soccer, on the other hand, uh, <laughs> with another dramatic win at Florida Gulf Coast last Sunday, uh, down 3-1, to one, they come back and win 4-3. to three. Four different players scored goals, including Carol Rodriguez, who I think has seven goals now on the season. And they've got a big road test coming up on Sunday, September 18th, this coming weekend, at Florida. Top 10 ranked Florida. National powerhouse Florida. Only a 90-minute drive away, Florida. So I would like to see some UCF fans go up and see uh, and, and check out that game as well. So it's Sunday at 7 p.m. Uh, in Gainesville. That's going to be a big test for Coach uh, Tiffany Roberts' Haydack squad, isn't it? It is, but what about the... <laughs> I mean, what a wild start to the year. It reminds me a lot of UCF football in 2013. Think of the – you mentioned that come from behind win against Florida Gulf Coast. You haven't even mentioned that they, they were down 2 nothing earlier this year in Stillwater against mm-hmm. Oklahoma State. Won so that game. Two, yeah, they won that game 3-2 to two in overtime. They so had a had late goal wins. at Stetson that won, yeah. that, that won that game. They were tied at one. They uh, got a late goal, that, and then they beat the weather in that game. In the, or Actually, that was the Florida Gulf Coast game where they were able to – they were able to beat the weather where they scored a goal in the 86th minute, and then lightning happened, and then they stopped the game before it went to full 90. Correct. So it's been wild. The thing that's exciting, during this four-match win streak, 14 goals scored. This team's got firepower offensively, which I had questions about when you lose to graduation a player like Spivey, who was their leading scorer last year. But they seem to have enough firepower from others. You mentioned uh, Rodriguez and so forth. So – it's been very impressive because, you know, certainly under Coach Sahadak in last year or two, defense was kind of the, the pedigree there with dominant goalkeeping, dominant backline defensively. They would win one nothing games, 2-1 games. Uh, this team has had to win 4-3 games and 3-2 and had to come back from multiple goals down. And it's a lot of growth for this team, and it's exciting. 
uh, for them. I'm certainly sure that Coach Zahedek would like to have better starts, like they did, for example, against FIU, where they just took them out of it and dominated that match from one minute one minute one to minute 90. But you're right. Um, Florida's going to be a challenge. Becky, uh, Coach Becky Burley has done a great job at the University of Florida. They're a top-10 program. They are a national title-type contender. Fourth but in UCF the country ha- in the coaches' poll, by the way. Fourth in the country, yeah. and, they, and they're 5-1 and one on the year. They're receiving one first-place vote, and yeah. uh, I'm, go- I'm actually pulling up their schedule right now. Yeah, and their only loss is in overtime at Stanford. Right. Uh, and at, yeah, so- overtime at Stanford. <laughs> that's so, that one to nothing, too. That's not easy. No, and they're very loaded, and they're going to win. They're the heavy favorites to win the SEC, and you know they're trying to get back to the College Cup, which has kind of been a bugaboo for Florida the last few years. But no, look, Florida UCF women's soccer is a huge rivalry. There's a lot of history there from a lot of NCAA tournament matchups between those two programs. Uh, the most recent success for UCF, I mean, if you go back to 2011, UCF knocked off Florida in the second round, and then knocked off North Carolina and Gainesville to get to the Elite Eight under Amanda Cromwell. Now, Lene Reyes is goalie. We'll never forget that save on penalty kicks to beat North Carolina. So there's been a lot of history there. And let's be honest, the way the NCAA tournament works, it wouldn't be a shock if this is a first of two meetings between these two teams, and maybe these two teams see each other again in November in postseason. So uh, I'm looking forward to that matchup. It's going to be an exciting matchup. Um, and it'll be interesting to me, can UCF offensively challenge that defensive, talented Florida team that has some firepower? Yeah. Uh, that will be very interesting. I believe that match should be available online, I think, on SEC Network+. Plus. Um, my good friend Adam Schick, who's the radio voice of Florida, does a lot of those matches on the SEC Network+. Plus. Nothing's, nothing's <laughs> mentioned on either of uh, of those. Well, there is a watch link up there. So, yeah, it is on Watch ESPN. So um, that yeah, should be available ahead, on I, Watch ESPN. Uh, and I encourage the audience to watch that. That'll be a good broadcast. Uh, that, 7 I'm p.m. Sunday, that. September 18th. Adam Schick will be on the call. Matthew Stubbington, I would assume, is their color analyst. I'm friends with both of them. Um, and I think they'll do a good job. Yes, they're Florida broadcasters, but you know, hey, that's the way it goes. You know, <laughs> they'll do. They they know their stuff. So I'm look. I will watch that. That'll be a good match, and that'll be a good challenge for Coach Sahida. Can you talk to her about it though? I mean, that's part of it. You want to challenge yourself and see where you're at when conference starts. Well, Florida certainly challenged themselves in the season. You mentioned the uh, uh, Stanford uh, game that they lost uh, one to nothing in OT. Um, but some other notes on this. Uh, right after that, they played Amanda Cromwell and Eleni yep. Reyes in UCLA in uh, in L.A., won that game 4-3 to three in overtime after losing to Stanford 1-0 <laughs> to nothing in overtime. Now, uh, another interesting thing that happened, though, in the coaches' poll, Florida right now number 4, Florida State 3, West Virginia 2, Stanford 1, UCLA, interestingly enough, 11th, but... Florida was supposed to play Florida State on Friday, September the 2nd. That game got canceled because of the storm. Right. Uh, one common opponent for the Knights uh, who beat Oklahoma State 4-3. to Well, Florida played uh, Oklahoma State out in Stillwater 2 and beat them 7-2. to So this is going to be, this Florida a game, as just like we expect, is going to be a good test for uh, Coach Robert Sahadak and, uh, and UCF uh, women's soccer. All right, time now for a new segment we're calling Three Stars, because I like hockey, but actually because uh, we're going to pick out the three best UCF performances in professional sports each week, each week. and this past week was, uh, NFL's, was the NFL's week one, and the first star I'm going to give is going to go to Blake Bortles, who went toe-to-toe with Aaron Rodgers in the season opener. Blake finished 24-39 for 320 yards. One touchdown, the one interception he threw uh, was bobbled around about five or six times, so it really wasn't his fault. Um, Kept Jacksonville in the game until inexplicably his head coach decided to throw a bubble screen on fourth and one with the game on the line, and uh, Green Bay got the stop and was able to get out of Jacksonville uh, with the win. But, uh, hey, how about Blake Bortles in the season opener going toe-to-toe with Aaron Rodgers? 
That was a great game in the uh, there, and I was there in person to see it. So I was privileged to watch that game in person. Aaron Rodgers is fantastic. Blake played very well. You mentioned I agree with you on the Gus Bradley call. Uh, unfortunately for Blake, uh, you had a chance there. He threw over 300 yards. He was tremendous. But uh, tough loss for the Jaguars. They got to go to San Diego this Sunday. But, uh, boy, Blake. Blake, so, I mean, I was in his post game. Just tremendous poise and, and great character and the leadership. I mean, he's so grown up. Uh, it's just they're proud of him and uh, his success there. Blake's an NFL quarterback now. Star number two. I'm going to give it to Matt Prater, who uh, is with the Detroit Lions oh, oh. now. Missed an extra point with 4.04 to play in their season opener at Indianapolis that put Detroit up 34 uh, 28. Indy goes down. Uh, Andrew Luck throws a touchdown pass. They're down 38. They're down 35 34. Matt Prater's going to be the GOAT, right? Nope. 37 seconds and three timeouts later, Georgia graduate Matthew Stafford moves Detroit down the field, and uh, Matt Prater hits the game winning kick uh, for, the, um, for the Detroit Lions. 43 yards, the game winner. And I love his quote afterwards. One of the reporters in Indianapolis asked him, what were your emotions after you missed the extra point? He said, I was pissed. Quote, I was so mad I could have kicked it from midfield. I was so mad, Brader said, end quote. So, but he kicks the game winner in Detroit, gets a safety on a wild play with no time left on the kickoff and wins 39-35. But uh, Prater, gets the, uh, Prater gets the game winning kick. Yeah, I'm going to disagree with you on my number two star. I mean, let's be honest. How many UCF people, when you saw Matt Prater miss that extra point, were flashback to Hawaii Bowl? <laughs> right? Yeah. So I, Nevada, when he missed that kick. So I'm going to go in a different direction. I'm going to go Latavius Murray, running back of the Oakland Raiders, 59 yards rushing and a touchdown as the Raiders go into New Orleans and win. And Latavius Murray is surrounded by a really talented Raider football team. Don't be surprised if Latavius Murray's playing postseason football this year. He's going to be carrying the load for that explosive offense. So really excited for Latavius and uh, hoping he can stay healthy. And I think he'll be very productive for that offense. My third star goes to Brashad Perriman, who we finally saw in a regular season game. Missed all of last season uh, due to an injury. Came in and got his first NFL catch against the Buffalo Bills for the Baltimore Ravens. It was the only catch of the game. Uh, for him in a in a victory for the Ravens in Buffalo. One catch for 35 yards, but a spectacular catch it was. Uh, check it out on YouTube. We'll actually uh, post a link to it in the show notes. But um, Brashad is in the NFL now. Then, of course, what happens? He's uh, actually held out of practice today <laughs> with with uh, with a, an injury. We don't now. He'll we don't know if he's gonna not gonna play in week two, but. Um, in fact, there's no indication to seem that he would not play in week number two. But Prashad finally with his first NFL catch. It was a good one. Hopefully we'll have a lot more from him. Amen to that. I like the kid. I, I covered him, obviously, and talked to him when he was at UCF. I have a photo in my room of that Hail Mary catch against East Carolina, November of 24, uh, in 2014. Then again, don't we all? I mean, it was just, I mean, maybe, right? I mean, it was just an amazing play that helped him win the co-conference title. So I wish him the best. He had the unfortunate injury last year, missed all of last year. It was just great to see him on the field and make a catch. And I think in the long run, he's going to make an impact for that football team. First round pick. Uh, I think they're going to take it easy with him. And I think that's the right move. But the fact that he was on that, I'm with you on that. Yeah, no one's talking about Baltimore. They're a pretty sleeper team right now. And if, they, and if they're going to – Kamar Aiken, too, is, is, uh, has found a nice little role for himself with that team. And if Prashad can get it going, um, they might be able to rebuild that thing very quickly with John Harbaugh, the head coach. Let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, TV here, Eric. I wanted to uh, mention – you mentioned a little scoop that you've got for us on the banneret. Yeah, if you go to the Banneret website, you will see my article where I break down the UCF Michigan television ratings. Uh, we have the national numbers, which has been reported by many different outlets. Uh, did about a 2.8 million on television. If you include streaming, it did about 2.9 million people watch the UCF Michigan football game. It was the third most watched football game of the of the day of the weekend behind. Tennessee, Virginia Tech, and Bristol, which was the ABC primetime game, and then Ohio State 
and Tulsa was the number two most watched game. Interestingly, UCF Michigan did better than uh, Florida Kentucky, uh, which was the CBS game at three thirty. But as you, if you, yeah, which surprised some people. Although you know, but if you what if you go to the Banneret right now and you read the blog, I have some we have some exclusive stuff that you don't get anywhere else, and I have the local numbers as we talk to the ESPN public relations people. Uh, the ESPN people that you know you've, you contact, and you certainly they'll give you the information if you're working on the story. And we have the local numbers and the ratings locally in Orlando, Jeff. Uh, if you read the scoop, but uh, was the number five market uh, to watch the UCF Michigan game? Obviously, Detroit, no surprise, was number one. But Orlando was number five. It did a 4.4 rating in Orlando. It was the most watched college football game of the weekend here in Orlando. Uh, it was the second most watched college football game of the week. If you include the Florida State Ole Miss game on Labor Day night, that was the by far the most watched college football game. And I go into detail about the the programming that was the number one sporting event of the weekend, which was the NFL, which is king in Orlando like it is everywhere else in the United States. But – Jeff, I mean, number five, we, you know, we so much talk about television market and the Orlando TV market and what does it mean and Knights fans and stuff like that. And uh, it did a 4.4. Now, it's the most watched UCF regular season football game since uh, 2013 when UCF played Houston. And they won that game, that dramatic game you remember, um, Bright House. Uh, it was an ESPN2 nationally televised game uh, that had a big implications on the conference. UCF won it 19 to 14. Brandon Alexander deflected the pass in the goal line at 30. Yeah. Goal. That was on November 9th, 2013. That game did a 4.8 rating in Orlando locally that night. So since then, there are, you know the, this is the most watched UCF football game since that game in a regular season. Of course, I'm not including the Fiesta Bowl between UCF and Baylor, which is the most watched UCF football game ever in Orlando. Interestingly, if you're wanting to know, and I and I wrote this and I broke it down in the blog, the most watched UCF football regular season game ever, 2013 in September, when UCF hosted Steve Spurrier in number 12 South Carolina. That game did an 11 and a half rating in that's Orlando. A, that's a monster number. It is. It's a huge number. Uh, a huge number. Back in September. That's, an, and, that's and, an NFL number. That number is an NFL number. Well, I mean, put it in perspective. That is an NFL. That's usually what the NFL gets locally. You're right. On an average. Uh, for example, the New England Patriots uh, Arizona Cardinals Sunday night football game was the most watched television event. In Orlando, not just sports, but in general, uh, Patriots, Cardinals, I think it did like a 12 rating, similar to that. Dallas and the Giants did a big number in Orlando. Florida State and Ole Miss did a 12.2 rating in Orlando for that uh, Labor Day night game. And so, it's important to emphasize that these are the numbers in the Orlando market, not the national numbers, for the, but, the correct. Num- but the ratings within the Orlando DMA, which is Orlando, Daytona Beach, and Melbourne. Correct. So that that was significant. One interesting note too, uh West Palm Beach, Jeff, was the number two market in Florida to watch the UCF game. There was ten markets that was the uh top ten to watch the UCF Michigan game. As I mentioned, Detroit was number one. Uh other markets include Columbus, Ohio, Dayton, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Nashville, San Antonio. West Palm Beach was number ten. How about that? Who would have thought West Palm Beach? Maybe I can a lot see of it. Night I can see it. Huh? A lot, a lot of night fans, a lot of night alumni in South Florida, and also um, a lot of folks who probably come down from the Midwest and have retired there. A lot of Michigan grads sure. probably down in uh, West Palm Beach too. So I'm not that surprised. Very interesting because I've studied these numbers. Like when, for example, when Florida State and Florida are playing, usually the markets that dom- that make that crack the top ten when those either one of one or both of those teams are involved. Is Orlando is Jacksonville? Jacksonville is the number one market usually when Florida State or Florida is involved, and then Orlando's right there, and then Tampa and so forth. Uh, it was fascinating to me that West Palm Beach cracked the list for the UCF game, and you re- you mentioned the reasons. Now, obviously, the ratings down from that UCF South Carolina game, uh, which was, by the way, UCF's first ever game on ABC that was ever televised. Um, but that game, you know, I think the the, the four point four. 
the game the game was kind of quickly over. It was what twenty four nothing in a blink of an eye. Yeah, it was so, over in a hurry. I would say that probably a lot of people tuned out, whereas that UCF South Carolina game, which did an 11 and a half, UCF was, you know, that was right right off. I believe they had just beaten Penn State, uh, Steve Spurrier in South Carolina. That was a hyped home game. It was a great game that came down to the fourth quarter. Um, so I think people stuck with that game. Also, uh, you know, so I think those are some of the reasons why the number didn't reach the South Carolina numbers. Uh, that maybe some were maybe optimistic and hopeful that they would do. Maybe if the Michigan UCF game would have been closer, maybe it would have got even a bigger number. Also, keep in mind, Florida State was playing right around the same time on Fox Sports Florida. So you have to believe uh, a fraction of the Orlando audience probably tuned to that game instead of the UCF game normally. Stuff like that. Maybe some people went to the Florida Kentucky game as a fan. So there's a lot of reasons, sports bars, et cetera. But I, you know, I found it interesting and, and it's important to show that Orlando tunes out tunes into UCF football games. Cause I know that's always been a topic when it comes to expansion and realignment and all that good stuff. Good stuff. And you can check that out on black and gold Uh, look it up with Elo. He's got the TV numbers for you. And we'll have that all season long on the banner. This will be your home for those kind of information. Again, nobody else has you hear this. that big 12. We're going to have those TV numbers for you. And good numbers, too. Uh, now, I will not have one for the Maryland game, by the way, because that's a CBS Sports Network game, and they do not release their numbers. So just a heads up. All right. So there you are with the TV numbers, Eric. What else do we have cooking this week? Where are you going to be? All right. So uh, just follow me, first of all, on Eric Lopez Elo on Twitter. Of course, I'll be producing Tuck and O'Neill on Sports Talk 1080, uh, the team weekdays. And uh, look, look for me on uh, on campus Saturday. I'm going to be on Saturday. We're going to look to cover the UCF Maryland game and – uh, then Monday night from downtown Orlando at Harry Buffalo, six to seven, I'll get to host the football insider show. We'll recap the UCF Maryland game, look ahead towards the FIU game. So that and much more among other sporting events going on. So, uh, looking forward to it. That's the best places to find me. And again, we got more content coming on the site as well to look forward to, uh, including, uh, the John Roddick interview. I had a chance to interview him last week, yes. uh, on my radio show on the, uh, insider show and, Really good in-depth stuff we're also going to have on the podcast where he talks about why he came to UCF, why, uh, what what drew him here, that USTA Center as far as where they're going to be playing their home matches in Lake Nona, uh, which is going to open in January in that facility, which is tremendous. And uh, how quick of a turnaround can he turn around UCF tennis like he did at Oklahoma? He discussed that and much, much more on the interview, and we'll break that down here as we'll be on the site. We're the first to interview him in the market, so we're excited about that as well. So I, I encourage you guys to check that out because uh, it's a really good listen. And I was very impressed, Jeff, very impressed with uh, Coach Roddick. I, I think UCF tennis is going to be unbelievable in the near or immediate future and probably quicker than people might think. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that, too. We're going to put that together and have that for you uh, over the weekend, early next week. Look for an interview with head coach John Roddick. I will also be on campus doing PA for the uh, volleyball tournament on uh, Friday, all day Friday and uh, in the early part of the day Saturday. Come on out to uh, UCF Volleyball at 4 p.m. Cool off from the tailgate and catch <laughs> UCF against the Chippewas. I'll be there uh, doing the pay- PA in the venue. And you can follow me online at Jeff underscore Sharon. Of course, you can follow Elo, like, he said, like you said, at Eric Lopez Elo. You can follow bl- the black and gold banneret at UCF underscore banneret also follow us on twitter and subscribe to this podcast on uh, itunes podcasts google play and stitcher eric always a pleasure brother i'll talk to you soon it's been a pleasure everybody have a good time this weekend and uh have hopefully fun. we'll get a win out of it that's right all right and for eric lopez i am jeff sharon this has been the black and gold banneret podcast we'll catch you next week Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, Just go to cars.com. It's magical.